we just look at influencers, by the time they're generally bringing a client to us, they're already net positive with revenue, meaning they're already doing a fair amount of work. So those managers have been acting transactionally. Maybe they've set up a merchandise business. Maybe they've like have a couple long-term partnerships with Fortune 500 companies. That's table stakes to get into a place like CAA. We need to see that not only do you have a following and a vision, but you have traction. Welcome to the Creator COO, the show where we surface the operators behind your favorite content and creators. I'm your host, Matt Estes. Today's conversation is with Andrew Graham, an agent with CAA's digital media team. Andrew has worked with well-known digital talent like Noah Beck, Matt Reif, the McFarlands, Jimmy Fallon, and Prince EA. In this episode, we discuss how CAA's digital media department works with its clients to package and monetize original IP and projects. We also talk about how to forge strategic brand partnerships with leading global advertisers, and we explore how traditional entertainment businesses are bridging the gap between Hollywood and the modern creator. So with that, I bring you Andrew Graham. Let's dive in. Andrew, thanks for being here. Welcome to the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I thought we could get started with something really basic, which is what does your role as a talent agent at CAA actually entail? What do you do day to day? Yeah, it's a great question. You think it would be like super simple, but the role has evolved even in the eight years I've been here at CAA. I mean, simply put, agents work in the United States really centers around monetizing our clients' careers which is pretty linear when you think about film or television or books, you know, you're selling a celebrity's book to a book publisher, you're getting sure. your acting client, a TV job, like in digital, it's so amorphous, right? Um, because there's so many ways to monetize in our space, which we're going to talk about here today. So really I spend my days thinking about how we can take the audiences our clients have built online and monetize them effectively. That could be, by way of endorsement work. So part of my life is spent in the brand world. It could be direct to consumer. So part of my life is thinking about how we move those audiences around and and monetize them. It could be through building out basically new business lines as well as it relates to this and emerging platforms. So, you know, within these major agencies that we've we've covered film and TV and music and books for a very long time, but now with these advent of new platforms, there's a lot of emerging technology that we cover. So, you know, if it's a new product that Facebook, I'm sorry, Meta launches or, or, or YouTube launches or TikTok launches, I and my team are the first ones into that space. During the pandemic, it became very popular to do masterclass style shows, mm. masterclass, studio, Wondrium. There were tons of competitors in this space. And so as an emerging technology and platform, this group touched it. So it's really hyphenated at the end of the day. So you mentioned you and you and your team, and you mentioned the word digital. Yep. I don't know a ton about the CAA organization and how it's laid out, but it sounds like, can, can you go into that? There's a, explain what is the digital team exactly? Sure. Yeah. Good. Also a good question because they're organized differently in different places, which is kind of unique. We're in this wild west moment. We've been saying wild west for 13, 14 years, but it remains wild and it still remains west. It remains wild. It very wild. We'll keep it wild. So there's about 28 of us in this group at at CA in the digital group spread out between New York, Nashville, and Los Angeles. I'm based in Nashville. I did 13 years in LA. So most of my CA career has been in, in the Los Angeles office. And really it's broken down into like three areas. One, folks that focus purely on influencer talent, right? They are signing and representing Tabitha Brown, Noah Beck, Vinny Hacker, Liza Koshy, Ninja, Dr. Disrespect. So esports, fashion, lifestyle, they're focused purely on talent. There's a group of folks that focus predominantly on corporate advisory work. So I neglected to mention this is something our group does. We are really involved with emerging tech companies, established brands that are looking to play in the creator economy. There's folks that focus exclusively on that. And then there's folks that focus exclusively on brand work, right? So uh, paid to post sort of work, because that is really the bread and butter of uh, influencer monetization still to this day. We'll talk about some outliers later. but And then there's a handful of folks that cut across everything. I'm one of those folks. I'm a generalist. I play in brands. I play in corporate advisory. I play in the talent space. Some of us that focus on the talent space as well do a lot of crossover work with traditional celebrities. So by way of example, like I'm... I do digital strategy on RuPaul's team and Nick Cannon's team 
and Jimmy Fallon's team, right? Traditional A-list celebrities that the agency represents in other areas. So that's it. So those are kind of like the three to four main areas. And it's a combination of folks that are specialists and then generalists across across that. That's group. super helpful. That last point you made is pretty interesting about the sort of the crossover of the celebrity into the into the digital. Yeah. What are some of the trends you would highlight you've seen over the last two, three years of the merging of the celebrity and maybe the I don't always love the term creator, but the sort of digital first, classically termed creator. Yeah. I think this is one of the most exciting things that are ha- that has happened in our space. And it's something that I think those that have been most enthusiastic about the creator economy have been heralding forever, but we are, we're finally there. You know, the, the notion that uh, traditional A-lists, actors, writers, directors, producers, musicians, athletes have an enormous ability to play in the creator first economy, right? We've been saying this for a long time. The rock was a very, very early mover of this a long, long time ago, but was a total outlier. So rewind the clock five, six years. You know, when I joined the agency, I was ready to bring every A-list celebrity into social media, this dawn of a new age. And really it was one of those moments in time where those A-list celebrities were like, I'll do two, three movies a year. I'll make $15 million per film. I have no interest in this, right? And that that's pretty difficult because part of my role, right, is also figuring out what 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 folks in the traditional space are willing to play with me outside of the creator influencer sort of sure. economy. Well, YouTube poured and YouTube has been, you know, there's a lot of talk of TikTok and they have done a great job in the short form space, but YouTube has done probably the most out of any organization or platform to push forward the creator economy, whether it's content ID work, whether it's financing original production, whether it's changing the perspective of advertisers in creator economy work, they have been the vanguard of that over and over again. And so YouTube poured some money into enabling traditional A-list celebrities to start producing content. I was fortunate enough to be a part of the team that did some of those deals. Zac Efron was one of those deals. Mm -hmm. Noah Schnapp from Stranger Things was one of those deals that we did. Uh, Will Smith was probably the best known example of this deal. And that that money acted as seed cash for a lot of traditional celebrities, meaningful folks that were not on YouTube in any real way to start producing content. Fast forward now, you look at Will Smith's activities on YouTube, it built Westbrook. Westbrook now owns Overbrook, which was his TV film production company for a long time. Westbrook is valued at close to a billion dollars, I think, as of today. That was never going to happen with a TV production company. What was the what was what was the change? The change was that he built an always on video strategy on YouTube. He started selling the inventory on his channel as media. In other words, he became a publisher. He wasn't just a personality. He was a publisher. So talent as publisher is one of the big trends that have happened. I remember, I think it was maybe a year ago, I saw Will Smith everywhere. TikTok, YouTube, you you couldn't get away from him. What separates... So you you point out like Zac Zac Efron and Will Smith as being two people who seem to really get the direct-to-consumer and the creator world. Yep. How big is the contingent of A-list celebrities that are interested in and get the creator thing versus those that aren't into it or don't get it? Yeah, that's a really good question. So there are those that know it's important, but don't know how to tackle it. And then there are those, I would say almost everyone knows that it is important at this point. The pandemic made that excruciatingly financially aware, painfully aware to a lot of folks, right? And now with the writer's strike, which is now concluded at the time of this taping, the actor's strike, which is still going on, it's important that you have a relationship with your audience. And so I would say almost everybody knows it's important, right? Of those that know it's important and are willing to lean in, in a really super meaningful way, which means sometimes investing their own money into hiring a social or video agency to do this. I would say probably like 20% of our clients now, right? Of that a list way, way up here, sort of like universe. So it's not, it's not a ton, but there are category exceptions, Matt. So if you look at what's going on in comedy right now, everyone is paying attention to it, right? You look at the explosion of Matt Reif, who's a client. Sure. Fortunately, when I get to work with, right? The guy's selling 30, 40,000 tickets a weekend right now. And it's all driven from TikTok and from Snapchat. 
You look at what he's doing. You look at what Ryan Long's doing. You look at what Andrew Schultz is doing. You look at what all of these different comedians are doing. It's all social short form yeah. crowd work. So com- comedy as a sort of sub niche has a very strong, a very yeah. high penetration in, in direct consumer. Yes. So I see film and TV. That's probably more of the 20% like grouping. Okay. Is it, is it 20% get it or 20% don't get it? Or aren't no, I think 20% are, are leaning in. I think everyone leaning knows in. it's okay. important, but these are people that are willing to go like, you know, I'm going to reach into my pocket. I'm going to yeah. pull out my car and I'm going to pay for, because that's what it takes to a certain degree. There's some companies out there that will finance video content, but yeah. it requires an investment. And Hollywood is built on OPM, other people's money, right? You do not reach into your own pocket, right? So this is, this is a sea change of thinking for a lot of uh, celebrities. Are there any particular concerns or obstacles that you see commonly that might stop the other the other eighty percent from really leaning into the creator thing? Yeah, one maybe I don't want to pay for it. Right, that might be one. Mm. Two is in order to like grow really rapidly and successfully on these platforms, and I think Will Smith is was exemplar of this is collaboration. It's not enough to just produce video, right? It's not enough to produce video and have smart metadata and good thumbnails. You got to collaborate with people that are in this ecosystem. Will was down to collaborate with every major. He was like, hmm. who, are, who is my peer group? But on YouTube, I'm going to work with them. And so he started yanking an audience from every major celebrity, everyone from Mr. Beast to Liza Koshy. He was there, right? So some celebrities aren't willing to do that. And probably the toughest thing is, People are time poor, right? They're really time poor. You're going to have to set a couple days a week, a couple days a month aside and stack shoot a lot of content. And I could see that one even that even relating a little bit to your first point around if you're time poor, you need help to do it, which costs money. So you've got to finance it. Yeah, potentially. I think AI is going to help here. I really do. We're going to get to a point where I think maybe some version of a digital twin will be able to take some of the lift off of off of a celebrity. Ah, the do- the doppelganger. Yeah. I I had an interesting conversation with a talent manager this week who we were we were talking about the difference between the A plus celebrity and, and the creator. And one of the hurdles that he, he he's a gentleman who works with both. And one of the things that he hi- he highlighted as a key difference was the comfort with going direct to the fan and being vulnerable. Yeah. And yeah. he used he used an example of I don't know her, but like Jennifer Aniston. Yeah. You know, she's, she's been an A-list celebrity for a long time, but she's maybe more protected in some ways yeah. by, you know, she has, she has a group of people that she works with and apparatus and she's gone, you know, she's worked through traditional channels. What's your take on that? I think, well, yeah, you're right. It does require at least a perception of vulnerability to build the parasocial relationship with an audience, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, think about Will Smith. I mean, is it would be hard to highlight somebody who's I can't think of a celebrity who's been more more vulnerable publicly than Will Smith. Gosh. And it's yeah. I think it's been it's amazing really for around. him building a connection with his audience. Yeah. I think there's also like an in-between moment, right? So I'll, I'll give you an example of a project that we put together that is somewhere between Will and like a Jen Aniston. So Jen, another Jen, Jen Garner. Jen uh, has been a client for quite a while. And during the pandemic, like the rest of us, was just stuck in her kitchen. And she started uploading videos on Instagram of her cooking. She called it her pretend cooking show because she okay. was bad at cooking and burning stuff. It was very relatable to me. I learned how to make salmon for the first time in lockdown in Palm Springs. But that video series that she did caught fire. And it was her being vulnerable, not in a way where it's like, oh my gosh, let me lay my heart bare here. It was like, I'm bad at cooking. I don't normally cook and I can't, I have to do this. Celebrities are just like us. Sure. That's what it felt like. That sort of like cosmetic vulnerability in a way performed really well. And we brought KitchenAid in and they wrote an enormous check to become the title sponsor of that. And that was treating her accounts like media. And that, again, to your very first question, what is one of the major trends and one of the things we're most excited about? You know, a, a basically a, a talent as a publisher, right? That's what we're excited about. What's the difference between what you do as a talent agent and a talent manager? And how does that fit? How does that fit within the creator ecosystem today? Okay, cool. Good question as well. So traditionally, there was this thing called the Talent Agency Acts in New York. And if, if listeners are interested, it's a very fascinating read. Um, 
to check it out. There was this guy named Lou Wasserman a long time ago in Hollywood that effectively represented the talent, <laughs> the production companies, the networks. And the government said, you need to break this up. Agents, you can go and procure work for clients. Managers, you cannot procure work for clients. Managers, you can produce. Agents, you cannot produce. It was a separation between church and state. Hmm. This is a long time ago. I think this is like, this might have been the 70s, 60s even. I think it was in the 70s though. And that's all well and good for the film and TV structure. But in the digital ecosystem, it's become a lot blurrier. There's a lot of managers that are acting transactionally and doing endorsement work for their clients, right? And not that there hasn't been this happening on the traditional side too. Like if you look at manager rosters over the last 20 years, they've swelled, right? 20 years ago, managers wouldn't have nearly the volume of clients they have now. Management companies are starting to look like tiny agencies within the volume of clients they represent. And you're watching tremendous consolidation in our, in our ecosystem happening right now. These management companies are acquiring one another to become bigger, to be more competitive. I say that just to say those are what traditionally the roles have been. Yeah. How has that, how has that changed in the, in the new sort of creator economy uh, in, in 2023? Managers at this stage, when we start to, if we just look at influencers at this stage, by the time they're generally bringing a client to us, they're already net positive with revenue, meaning mm-hmm. they're already doing a fair amount of endorsement work. So those managers have been acting transactionally, right? Maybe they've set up a merchandise business. Maybe they've like have a couple long-term partnerships with Fortune 500 companies. That's sort of, that's table stakes to get into a place like CAA. We need to see that not only do you have a following and a vision, but you have traction, right? And traction in the creator ecosystem is normally dollars, right? In film and TV, maybe, but it's like, they had a really wonderful performance. They have a lot of buzz coming out of this Sundance indie film, right? It's, it's a different metric for what qualifies as someone that the agency is going to look at. So managers are acting highly transactionally. Once that client is in the building with us, generally speaking, the roles go somewhere back to, to normal, right? So as agents, it's our responsibility to take directions from managers as to where they want to drive a client's business, right? You know, we're really keen on launching a liquor brand. Okay, great. Like, let's pull the data. Let's partner the client with a manufacturer. Let's maybe go right to a retailer. We know it's going to happen. We are the sales apparatus at that point in time. This doesn't mean managers aren't finding work for clients as well, but they're inclusively bringing that business into the agency for us to work on together. It's an institutional sort of partnership. That's an interesting example. The so the this I take this abstract idea of you know creator comes in wants to. Uh, I don't do yep. the George Clooney thing and, and launch a successful alcohol product. Liquor business. Yep. Where where do you fit as a talent agent in taking that from idea to, hey, we've actually delivered a bottle of tequila to a shelf of a yeah. liquor store? Yeah. We're in the trenches from the very beginning of it. And there's any any variety of ways of going about this. There's versions of this where you go to a Diageo right? One of the largest liquor manufacturers in the world. They're probably going to own the thing, right? They'll do a, they'll, they'll own it. They might partner with you on almost an ambassador level, right? To go and create something that's going to end up on shelves. In that instance, you've got money, you've got distribution, you've got formulation, you're done. That's maybe one route we take. Maybe Mm -hmm. it's critical that the talent owns a lot of it. Well, then we might go to a company that's an incubator, right? That can, that incubates brands. And it might be a co-ownership between the talent and the incubator and they'll build a proof of concept. We'll then go and try to sell it into retail. You get purchase orders, you scale the business. Like that's, that's another route, right? There's other versions of this where you go into private equity money and you go right to a manufacturer and you start from the bump. So we're at the beginning, we're plotting out, where do you want to be? Do you want to own yeah. it? Is it a cash grab? Is it a long-term business? Yep. How involved do you want to be? And then we're backing into different models based off of that. So let me, let me, sp- state that back to you and make sure I, I grasp it because I find that fascinating. So there's there's perhaps a spectrum of how involved the talent wants to be. So uh, you have a spectrum of like less involved, much more involved. And then presumably the economics change a lot from less involved to more involved. But then the investment level also changes a lot from less involved to more involved. And the operational complexity changes a lot from less involved to more involved. Are there any talent that you could point to that you think might sit on the consistently on the more involved side of the fence 
than the less involved. Because less involved, I think to me makes faster intuitive sense. It's like, okay, you can go and do like a brand licensing deal. But yep. what about the other side? Totally. Someone like Liza Koshy has been extraordinarily involved in her businesses. Very, very, even in the collaborations, her same law collaborations, her Fabletics collaborations. She is approving and opining upon all of the designs, all of the marketing. I would argue that she is almost acting as a creative director in a lot of these instances. And she likes that role, right? You got to remember some folks come to the table and they're like, I may understand what I'm doing really well in my video, but I'm out over my skis or I actually don't enjoy that part of it at all. I can't come to the page blank, right? There are folks like, there are folks like that. And it's just a straight licensing deal to your point on it. Liza is very, 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 very involved. Tabitha Brown is super involved, right? Her line at Target, her line of seasonings with McCormick and Schmidt, which are extraordinarily lucrative and very successful. She's very, very in 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 the weeds on it, you know. And I think what those 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 brands become most successful when it feels like the audience is a part of it, and the audience doesn't want to feel like the person that is creating the brand isn't invested, right? So there's a little bit of smoke and mirrors depending on how involved someone wants to be, right? If you're a creator who's thinking about being more involved and you're thinking really long term in terms of the economics that you want to generate yep. and the, the the brand affiliation, what's the best path that you can take today as talent yep. to long term maximize value? What is that phrase? It's an African proverb. You want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go together. Right. My perspective, it's it's partially it's the right team, and when I see the right team, I'm not saying just the right agents by any means. And you, you know, Matt, you and I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago about this. You reach a certain level of scale, you might need to bring in a CEO, a COO. You might need to bring in people that are really good at things that you're not good at or you don't want to do. I mean, look at Mr. Beast's business. I mean, it is stacked ceiling to floor with executives that have very specific roles within that organization in order to make the magic happen every day. So I would say one Decide where you want, both where your wants and your abilities align and own those things. Where your wants and abilities don't align, bring in partners for that. Or, you know, where you're going to have real, realistically the ability and time to go and crush something. Sure. Like maybe you do and we, really love. You know, I recall that conversation and we had talked about yeah, potentially bringing in, I love Mr. Beast's example because he has such great talent yeah. and he's got big ambitions and he, I think he's aligned he's aligned his level of investment with where he wants to go. You shared this term with me called, it's packaging, I think is an industry term. So bringing, oh, bringing a yes. team together to execute. And on the CEO, COO front, I can tell you, I, I for one have actually had a really hard time finding fantastic yeah. operators to partner with, with creators. So curious if you have any advice as to when you're packaging deals, when you're, when you're packaging these teams, where do you go to find great operators to partner with, with talent? man, that's, that is it, right? Fortunately, being at CA, it's not just all on me or just my department. Our ventures group through Evolution, well, first of all, there's Connect Ventures, which is CA's investment arm. We know a lot of founders and a lot of great operators through that that we plug sometimes into businesses we invest in. Evolution Media Capital, right? The banking arm of this company has a lot of those relationships. And our business development group, which is run by a guy named Michael Yanover. I mean, I would say like his roster is rosters of operators. Like that is like what he's not signing them the way we do film and TV, but there's so many projects that he has to have it. Like by way of example, we build house beauty labs, Haas beauty labs, Lady Gaga's right. Um, cosmetics business. We found the executive to put into that, into that organization. And so that's one, but two, like sometimes with these partnerships that are revolving around manufacturers, we look to them to help us find a good executive to, to do this. I think the hardest type, I mean, it's really linear if it's cosmetics or if it's like, you know. I, I suppose if, if it's or, cosmetics, then you can go to the cosmetics industry and find somebody who has but if it's in the creator space, deep domain it's a expertise. Lot harder. It is. It's a lot harder because I think probably the right type of person that's going to run a media business a la a beast or any of these others, like it's someone that has like real domain expertise in being with a creator. So they probably have a talent management background. Mm -hmm. They got a really sharp operational mind and that's not every great manager. Some managers are highly creative and just 
not good operators, right? So it's a weird subset. I don't think you have to have an MBA to run one of these businesses at all, but you have to be organized and have a really clear understanding of what the marketplace overview looks like. And I think, you know, there used to be a really clear path, you know, agent or, you know, talent agent leaves talent agency, runs clients production company. I mean, this was Tom Cruise's agent's trajectory as well. It doesn't Mm -hmm. exist anymore. Like now that we have Heartbeat and Westbrook and Hello Sunshine and Down Home here in Nashville, Tim McGraw's business, and we're confidentially in the middle of building quite a few more of these. Like, you're going to need people like me, right? You're going to need people that are, that understand the talent, the media and entertainment side of this business, but also understand the creator economy and understand the social and video space. So, not a lot of me's. And by the way, the other me's that are out there may or may not be operationally capable or aspirational in this space. So it is really, really, it's really hard. I'm not going anywhere, by the way. Can you um, talk through a couple way. of, a couple of the examples you named that are really interesting. So, you yeah. know, Tim McGraw, for example, what is going through Tim McGraw's head when he's thinking about building a media brand? Why is he doing it? I want ownership, right? I don't want to, there's a version of like, you know, for a lot of these large musicians, it's like, I'll finance my own masters and I'll license them back to the label. And I, own the record. Okay. What's the record worth? I mean, not as much as the record label or the publisher is, right? So it's not as much as as the the films and TV shows that use your music. So it's about building real equity and ownership in these businesses. And it, it is makes also, sense that they would want to also, own more of more of the economics and maybe have more more control over the the creative output. I, th- I think that's part of what you're yes. saying. It is, but also like there's a particular white space for Tim too. And I'll, I'll be quiet, but I'm particularly passionate on this particular point is like, you look at what a lot of Hollywood as a just, you know, overarching term is producing. There's a lot of appetite in middle America that's not necessarily being served. And Tim's thesis, and I think he's right, is there's an ability to produce TV, film, podcasts, books, digital first content for the heartland, for the middle part of the country. If you look at pole stars, some of the top performing comedians of this of the last year have been Southern, faith-based, clean, middle America. You look at the box office, you have the sound of freedom beating out Indiana Jones. You look at the top, you know, billboard charts. There's a lot of country there. You look at everything that's come yeah. out of Yellowstone. I could go on and on and on. Like he has a moment in time to grab that uh, and be the standard bearer. So he, he's an ambitious, he's a, he's an ambitious guy who wants to build a big business and he sees a, he sees a huge opportunity. What does that team look like that he builds around yeah. himself? Sure. We're in the early innings right now, but he did a first look deal with Skybound, huge, huge media company that they're servicing on the, on the TV and film front. So there's a, there's a handful of TV executives, a handful of film executives, They have a head of partnerships that's within that organization that is really focused on building out what is like the consumer product side of down home look like, right? Could they build a liquor brand? Could they build a neighborhood? I mean, what can can you go and build? Really sort of like blue sky kind of um, dreaming work. They hired a head of digital. So there will be an always on video strategy. The thinking is, can we bring, maybe we give grants out to individual talent to produce some content. Maybe that upstreams into film and TV at some point. It certainly feeds the social circle of what we're trying to do. It's basically the consumer facing part of this brand. And then later on, how do you stack in podcasts or, you know, books or or what have you, but it's effectively an executive to lead each and every one of these business units. But the social and video piece is the heartbeat, the brand, the identity, Mm. because beyond an audience, I mean, does the audience care about Paramount Plus? Like, I don't think they really do. They care about Yellowstone. Like, there's an opportunity to, again, make a media brand mean something when it's built around a personality. And social and video is going to be the way that they reach those audiences every day. And when you have a media network, all of a sudden you are the network. You can go and take Burt's Bees, right, and run $2 million worth of media through your YouTube and Facebook and Instagram accounts. It's It, it becomes really it becomes a microchasm of the broader media landscape. It's super exciting. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So you've got the, you've got the down home, you've got Tim McGraw down home at the top. And then the idea that you would bring an executive in for each of the high potential business units makes a ton of sense to me. And then presumably you still need a CEO or a COO at the top. You need a core business to start one of these things. So if you're a film and TV talent, probably the core business on day one will be 
film and TV, right? Yeah. If you're a musician, it's probably, I mean, Tim's a unique example because we did the uh, Skybound deal, but could be music. The ancillaries are, you know, publishing, books, audio. Digital technically could be an ancillary, but it's also the brand as well. So it's it sort of sits in a quasi weird, weird spot. But in order to launch one of the things, you need one or two of these core businesses to, to get off the ground because you need to fundraise against something. And then you have to sort of question, okay, as a celebrity, am I putting all of my personal fees into this company? Am I only yeah. putting my producing fees into this company? How do we evaluate this yeah. as well? Can we, can we double click into that piece? Because I've, you know, I've personally been involved in growth equity and tech investing, yeah. but, but never investing in something like this. And so my first question is, when you're fundraising for something like this, who invests in this type of an organization? Media companies invest. So you can get strategic money. I mean, theoretically, if you were a huge Viacom talent, could you get a check from Viacom? I think Viacom should make that bet. I also think that as Viacom spends more and more time on Paramount Plus and doesn't pay attention to the Nickelodeons and the MTVs, the celebrities that came out of those spaces are going to pick up those audiences. I think Viacom is going to have to buy back their influence in this space. And so maybe a way to mitigate it is to invest, right? That's one. Family offices, certainly another one that have become increasingly popular. And there are some media funds that are focused on really like, you know, generally like media and consumer brands. So it's it's not that dissimilar then from the maybe traditional tech investing in that you've got strategics and high net worth individuals, family offices, and then some institutional equity investors, I imagine. Yep. Or can you do a deal, right, on the – and I, I'm, I'm actually I'm not privy to whether there was more than the Skybound deal with Tim, but can you go and do a deal that finances the whole thing, right? So it's a first look, but maybe you don't give up any equity in it. I don't know the the inner – inner elements of that, but that is also an option, right? We talked a lot about uh, celebrities who maybe want to move more direct to consumer and be maybe more like creators. Are you seeing creators who want to be more like celebrities? Mm, a little bit. I mean, there's always the mystique of, of film and TV. I will tell you this, for a comedian that breaks on a Netflix special, there's a very real correlation between Netflix special and ticket sales. I have seen off of Stranger Things. I have seen off of different television shows like the the cultural zeitgeist that is imbued in a particular town. Now, not everywhere does that. Does HBO Max do that? Does Paramount Plus do that? Not in a way that like Netflix does. And so from a marketing standpoint, they're still valuable platforms. I don't think you have someone that's going around and saying, I want to be a Nickelodeon star anymore. Like that doesn't, that doesn't exist. It's particularly on like the more youthful on the more youthful side, but mm. across the board, I think everybody wants to be a mogul, right? Everyone wants George Clooney made more money selling Casamigos than he will ever make being an actor, right? That is the aspirational right. thing. How do I own? How do I become a mogul? Right? Have substantial equity in, in things. At this point, there's more economic and cultural gravity pulling towards the direct to consumer relationship than the reverse. Like maybe there's some creators out there who just want to make great content and get big distribution through a generation 1.0 publisher partner. But it seems like the gravity is clearly the other direction. It is, but there's like also like this weird fascination with brick and mortar for talent. Like when their mm. product, it's like, you can explain it a million times. You're like, listen, you're like, you're not holding inventory. You have a higher margin. Like, why are you trying to put this into, you know, X, Y, Z retailer, Right. Hot Topic, Tilly's, American Eagle, like, no, like, like from a business, like I understand there might be a marketing element, but that feels like an incredibly validating sort of moment to see your stuff on, sure. on shelves. I used to think it was because, you know, these, these talent that we represent at one point shopped in these stores. And so that was like sort of a super validating thing. And that might still be part of it, but there's just something about the brick and mortar that's still very appealing. I could see that. It's, there's, there's something, pride, ego. Yeah. That, that validation, that that sort of like non-quantifiable validation moment psychologically yeah. makes perfect sense to me. Totally, 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 totally. What are your predictions for where the talent agency business and where the talent management businesses are going? And I realize those are separate things and they're sort of evolving together, but where do you think they're headed? Well, I would say this. I think managers have been positioned to be 
in a way, equity participants with their clients for a long time as producing partners, getting points on, on projects. Agents, not so much. I think the agency business has to figure out how to become equity participants in their clients' businesses. You see what ultimately transpired with the Writers Guild strikes and fights between the talent agencies. Man, I mean, the talent agent, the, the, for those that are not familiar, like the net result is that packages are no longer being paid to the talent agencies, meaning a percentage of the production budgets and royalties coming off of TV shows used to go to talent agencies. You know, everything from Game of Thrones to ER are things that CA would get packages, percentages on. That's gone, right? That always on royalty has disappeared. So what is the new package? What is the new always on royalty? The agencies have to figure out how to have a piece of these businesses and add a new layer of value to their artists' businesses. You, not to put you too much on the spot, but do you have any thoughts as to what the solution might be? Or maybe the, what the thought. subset of potential solutions might be? Yeah, I've spent some time thinking about this, Matt. Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, listen, there's one old school way, which is like invest. Invest, mm -hmm. put hard, the agency should take money off of, the agency should take money off of their balance sheets and invest them to client projects. Some of them are doing that already. That does happen. That opens a can of worms. Well, you know, agency, you invested in Matt, but you invest in Andrew. Well, why didn't you invest in Andrew? Mm -hmm. Like that can be fraught with some challenges. That's one thing. Two, maybe new layers of services that we're offering. Some of these operational pieces that we're talking about, maybe some of the social and video um, support systems that, that need to take place. Now, do we offer them gratis? Do we do a trade out? I, I, don't, I don't know, but earn your way in. So you either buy your way in or you earn your way in. Yeah, ca cash equity or sweat equity. Makes sense. It's something like that, probably. It's going to have to take place. So that's where I think it's headed for the agencies. They have to really, they have to really figure that out because the big, big money, whether actors, writers, directors, producers, or these influencers, those are coming on these major consumer product exits, right? And sure, you do a couple million dollar deal with Nissan, you do a couple, you know, million dollar deal with, you know, Wilson Sports, great. But man, you have a piece of a business that sells for a hundred, two hundred million dollars. It's a whole other story. So we need to think a little bit more entrepreneurially. Right, we need to be think about being principals in businesses as opposed to just ten percent ancillary sort of advisors. That yeah. is the biggest switch that has to happen. You're highlighting an interesting potential risk to the to the agency business. Are there any other are there any other risks or headwinds that you see either agents or managers need to think about preparing for combating? I mean, there's 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 micro concerns that exist out there as we sort of think about AI. Right, it's a scary sort of moment as well. Mm. Right, we're in the business of representing personalities, and all of a sudden, personalities are now being replicated as well as manipulated. It's not in the control of the representative or the talent. It's a very scary and sort of dangerous thing. So, I, I'm as much as we can put together standards and practices, we certainly should. I think we should lean as forward as possible. I think actually, what really should be happening is all of the talent agencies should be aligning on a on a strategy because this is not existential to one three letter agency, but not another three letter agency. All yeah. the lettered agencies are at equal. All right, I know this is. I know this is a topic that uh, you mentioned, Mr. Beast, earlier. Mr. Beast has been pretty vocal about the AI. Yeah problem and him and some of his group have tried to put together as a trade a trade union they've been working on creators.org yes. is one i think there's a couple uh, guilt, other ones yeah. that have surfaced yeah, yeah. to try to try to come yeah, together yeah. and i think part of that is i guess it's coming together to negotiate with a platform like youtube to help you to enforce the threat of ai standards and practices around yeah. this yeah and you're right it's probably the we're not going to be able to like turn it off at the source at the faucets right open ai all these other sort of platforms chat gpt like you're not going to be able to necessarily control that but you can con hopefully control the distribution mechanisms you know when i was at vid summit i got some time with kwebelkopf um jordy and he was showing me a handful of these videos that he had created via ai these channels that he had launched like six seven eight months ago one of them had like a million subscribers on it it's like the voiceover is AI. The script is AI. Yeah. The video is AI. I mean, it wasn't super, I mean, it was like how to cook a dumpling. Like it wasn't like, oh my gosh, earth shattering, going to, you know, tap into the primal tribalism of humanity. But like, we're getting there. Like, so yeah. we need to get, we need to get sort of our act together around this. And I think it only works sort of like collaboratively, but that's not like a, I mean, that is like a business existential threat, but it's a very, it's a very different 
one. And I also think like, this is tough in any big business, but don't just chase the money, right? Don't just chase the the trends, take a step back. I would say being self-critical for a minute, we spent a lot of time looking over the last few years on really, really short form content. What we've come to find is that a lot of the creators of that short form content don't have as sticky of an audience as long form content. We chased endorsement dollars. We chased trends. We're really refocusing in this new year to tackle long form scale YouTube talent, at least out of this group again. So, you know, don't, don't get caught in the own hype. You know, it's easier said than done though. We try to wrap these conversations up with a couple points of specific advice for the audience. And most of the audience are, you know, either creators or, or creator COOs. If a creator COO is along with their creator partner, of course, going to start working with a talent agent like you or somebody else at CAA, what would you want them to know going into that relationship to to best work with with you, Andrew? Yep. Great. Good question. One, talent agents are really not great when they don't have focus, right? So they work walking into that room, know where you want to go, right? Who you want to be. Have a point of view is really critical. It can't be, I want to do everything all at once, right? Have a, have a perspective and be able to give focus to that agent. That's one. Two, know that when you're partnering with CA, right? You're partnering with me. I don't want to speak for our competitors, but particularly us, we're institutional partners, right? So this is not, hey, you know, I've never done a TV show in my life, support my TV career, but I'm going to hold on to all of my digital and endorsement business. When you work with us, it's an institutional, we're getting married, right? All the projects, all the revenue is coming in and we're going to add value to all areas, right? If you don't, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. Or, you know, someone's out in marketplace selling a Coca-Cola deal while you're accepting a Pepsi offer. You can see how this gets really messy. So if you're going to work with an agency, going to be partners, right? Mm -hmm. And then also pick it based off of chemistry. Who do you think really gets you? right? At the end of the day, like this is a partnership. You're going to be spending a lot of time with this team. Make sure there's a real connection with the person. They understand your brand. They understand your vision. It's not to, not something to sort of breeze over, over lightly because more or less all the talent agencies, major talent agencies have the same capabilities more or less, but it's the people and the culture that makes a real difference. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that we've been so incredibly successful is the culture at this company. It's the reason I've been here for eight years. And it's the sort of stuff I would think about going into it. If you're an A-list celebrity who wants to go more the creator direction, or you're a creator who's okay. just looking for operational help, what advice would Got you it. give to them in terms of finding that help and building out that team? And I ask this because you have so much experience with the packaging, you know, packaging some more of these complex, complex uh, products and services. I imagine you've seen this go right, but I also imagine you've seen this go wrong. Yeah, right. Well, we can start with the the traditional to digital, like where it's gone wrong is, oh, well, I'll just put my TV executive on it. Or, you know, I'll put my documentary filmmaker to shoot these, like pick someone that understands the sensibility of the platforms that you're producing for, right? Also know if you're a traditional talent, like the work is not done once it's shot, right? You need to understand metadata. You need to understand the thumbnails being given. Uh, being produced correctly. You then have to comment on the content, right? So the job is not done when the film is in the can at all, right? So know that about these platforms and partner with someone. And there's a whole cottage industry of companies that will do some of this on rev share, meaning no money out of pocket, just sharing revenue based off of the revenue generated on those videos, as well as retainer. There's a whole group of people that are experts on this every single day, right? Um, that can help you on this your Studio 71s, your Viral Nations, your Jelly Smacks, right? We know all of these folks. Um, and we partnered with a great deal of them. Get engaged as well. And so I think so your, your point there is, if you've got big dreams and you want to build something great, the support exists. You don't, you don't have to go it alone. You shouldn't. And you will yeah. not be successful if you try to do it alone. But pick people that have domain expertise in the area in which you want to play in. That, that's the traditional side of things. And then if you're on the creator side of things, it depends how far along you are, but start with the manager. I mean, there are moments where we sign clients and they don't have management, right? That's very early and unusual mm -hmm. for us. Managers are set to help you clarify your perspective, keep you honest in the marketplace opportunity, and keep you organized and executing. They are your COO at first, right? Is sort of the way to think about them. Start there, then build around that. There's nothing wrong with a personal assistant either. I got to tell you, like, 
you know, your manager does not want to be your personal assistant either, right? That's a different role. Start with management. By the time you get to an agency, you're then accelerating a lot of your sales efforts and the agency can then start to help think about the other pieces of the puzzle they, they, they put in place for you. Yeah. I like, I like that. I like the way that you've defined the, the talent manager as an early stage COO. I think that that definitely yeah. resonates with me in my experience, chatting with creators yeah. at the earlier stage. And I think it would resonate with them as well. Is there a point at which somebody, a, the, the creator outgrows the talent manager as, as the CEO partner? Is there, are there obvious clues that you see? Yeah, I think when your business lines get really big, right? You look at Feastables, God, that's a whole company, right? Yeah. Like you, you can't have, a, you can't have a manager running that. I think when you start to build business lines that are, are that require like daily focus in managing teams, you need to start putting up, even if those teams are third party manufacturers, you need to put someone on it, right? If you raise money, my God, you probably need to put someone on it, right? You may raise three, four, $5 million to launch a cosmetic business. Please spend a quarter of a million and hire a CEO for it, Right. I think it. Be, I think it's pretty self evident when, when those moments happen. So, so to your point there, the like you know, your, your earlier stage, the complexity of your business is less, and so the talent manager can really act as your core operating partner. As complexity grows, then maybe you got to think about some other potential solutions. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to be just doing endorsement work or writing one book a year, like you don't need a whole apparatus. Know, you don't need right? the infrastructure built. Right. No. But when you start having an eight-figure merchandise company, like, yeah, like you do need you need a team around that, right, as well. And also, it's worth thinking what you bring in-house and what you partner on. I think a lot of folks have that tendency, particularly as creators that have built it themselves, to try to do it all themselves. And that reaches a point where it makes sense to partner. And eventually, if you want to bring it in-house, bring it in-house. But there's nothing wrong partnering with people early on. In fact, it's actually helpful. You You learn a lot in that process. I think that's right. I do think... You know, my conversations with with creators and some of the bigger YouTubers, they do have this basic tendency to want to do it themselves. And that's probably why they were so successful to start. But it's really hard to scale that way. You got to delegate. That's right. Something at some point. You have to, you know, and there's a difference between having transparency into your business and trying to run it all yourself, right? You can have transparency and delegate. Any parting thoughts or words of advice for the audience? Well, listen, I'd say this is the most exciting time in the world to be talent, regardless of where you're at. You have more power than you've ever had in this sort of space. The most exciting products are coming out. People trust people. They don't trust media institutions. They don't, under, they don't, they don't trust politicians, but they trust personalities, right? And so this is a really, really wonderful time to be in this business, whether you want to be a manager, you want to be an agent, whether you want to partner with talent. I would say it's an open door. My job and the job of people like me is to package, as we said earlier. So it's an open door. Please reach out. It's Andrew period Graham at ca.com. Shoot me a note anytime. Happy to chat or just call one of our many offices lines and they'll, they'll get you to me. Thanks for taking the time, Andrew. I hope we do it again soon. My pleasure. Grateful for the time. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Creator COO. If you found this valuable, you can subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. Also, please consider giving us a rating and a review as this helps other creators and creator COOs like you to find the podcast. This episode was produced by Rebecca Donovan at Uscreen with support from the team at Share Your Genius. It was edited by Chandler Chapel with artwork designed by Spencer Marsh. I'm Matt Estes, and you've been listening to The Creator COO. See you next time.